Good afternoon and welcome to Praxis Peace Institute's Earth Day special on Zoom. I'm Georgia Kelly, the director of Praxis, and today we are thrilled to welcome noted environmentalist, author, and entrepreneur, Paul Hawken. Paul has dedicated his life to environmental sustainability and changing the relationship between business and the environment. He founded several companies, including Erewhon, one of the first natural food companies in the US that relied solely on sustainable agricultural methods. And he co-founded Smith and Hawken. He's also the founder of Project Drawdown, a nonprofit dedicated to researching when and how global warming can be reversed. He has written eight books, including five national bestsellers, and his book, The Ecology of Commerce, was voted number one college textbook on business and the environment by professors in 67 business schools. But the book we're going to talk about today is Regeneration, Ending the Climate Crisis in One Generation. This is a <clears throat> phenomenal resource book that chronicles multiple solutions to the climate crisis in every area of our lives. In fact, I'm going to hold it up right now so you can see it. I'm highly recommending that you go out and buy it. It's an extraordinary book, and I'm going to have Paul say a few words about it before we get into the interview. Uh, it, it really is a comprehensive overview that also gets into the weeds of where we are and what must be done in the next decade in order to mitigate the worst fallout from the climate crisis. But it is also about creating the story and learning from the extraordinary models that are showcased in this book. So welcome, Paul. It's great to have you with us here today. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for attending and Thank you, especially Fran and David Corton. I feel David Corton has been my teacher and mentor for a long time. And so it's so sweet to see you both here. And uh, thank you for coming. And for those who I don't know, I'm glad to meet you today. Great. I'm actually going to let a few more people in right now. Okay. okay. Yeah, they're muting themselves. They're very good. All right. So what I'd like you to do first, uh, Paul, is to explain the best way to approach this book, because although I read all the way through it, uh, you said that isn't necessarily the best way to read it. So uh, give our audience a sense of how best to approach the book. Yeah, I uh, I didn't realize how long it got. <laughs> it's 140,000 words, and um, I just was so involved with it that I didn't do a word count until the end. My publisher did. It made me stop. Uh, <laughs> and so I had to cut some things out. The best way to read it, in my opinion, is the to read the introduction for sure, and maybe the next section called agency, because it really is about agency, so much of what generation is. And then go wherever you want. Go what interests you, what like makes you curious, or you already know something about it, or uh, it's something you know nothing about, but now you do want to know something, or explore. So it really depends on the reader. And um, I think it's best read from the middle out, so to speak. In other words, where, where you just go where you want to go in the book. Um, obviously, I wasn't thinking about that when I wrote it. I was just <laughs> dogged in okay. sections. and Yeah. So you mentioned that you might want to read a paragraph from the book you're working on now before we start the interview. Do you want to do that or would you rather do it later? I'll do it anytime. I'm, uh, but just as a background, uh, I'm writing a book called The Book of Carbon. And uh, I think the subtitle is A Love Story. I'm not sure. I might change the subtitle, but it is a love story for sure. And not a romantic story. It's uh, love in the, in, the, in, in the way Heraclitus talked about it, which is love is knowledge. And uh, I'll let, I'll just read a little bit first. And then um, <clears throat> uh, the only known form of life is based on carbon uh, and it's unique in its capacity to form long chain molecules that store energy and carry information with the genetic code. From a planetary point of view, the warming atmosphere is not a pending apocalypse. It is a teaching. It's feedback. The apocalypse comes about if we skip school. After more than 50 years of unwavering coaching by climate scientists, the world seems to have fully awakened the global warming. 
climate is front and center for most companies, countries, and universities. Investors and technology are birthing the greatest capital expenditure event in human history. This came about late, but it has arrived. The motives are clear. If carbon dioxide emissions are not curtailed, civilization will be. This is not a prediction. It's the same climate science that was long ignored. Arresting climate global warming will be the fulcrum of finance and governance in the coming decades. Although banks, investors, and pension funds were once apathetic to financing a livable future, the prospect of decarbonizing the $96 trillion world economy has changed many minds. What's on the agenda? Every home, car, train, plane, truck, city, ship, product, farm, building, and utility in the world. In terms of resources, all wood, meat, food, steel, concrete, fiber, fisheries, and mines. For years, the news on climate was greeted primarily by indifference, no longer. But the attention being paid to fossil fuels tends to place forests, oceans, cultures, wetlands, biodiversity, and waterways as secondary. Fossil fuels are important, yes, but not as important as the full climate emergency. It is well known that coal, gas, and oil harm the atmosphere, but how the biosphere generates the atmosphere is sort of put aside, and that's for science classes. The verbs used around climate change are emblematic of this separation, like fight and tackle and combat. Melanie Challenger puts it succinctly. We are trying to, to design life on our own terms, even while we are killing life on its terms. The erosion and collapse of living systems is the inevitable outcome of our disconnection to the natural world. If human needs outstrip the carrying capacity of the planet, our attempt to redress the atmosphere will hardly matter. The focus on decarbonization and net zero emissions should be called the carbon tunnel syndrome. Thank you for that, Paul. So that will be out when? When is that book published? 24, I don't know, my publisher is. So all the publishers are behind now because books did so well during COVID, but they didn't have staff. So it's kind of lopsided. And so it's taking longer to get to publication. Well, in the meantime, there's plenty of time to read Regeneration. Yeah. on this call. So yeah. one of the things, I'm going to jump to a latter part of your book because um, I was fascinated by the section on industry and what you highlighted in it. So I'm going to skip to a couple of those areas of industry that you noted, and one was the war industry. Mm. And you made an equivalency that I thought was really interesting to just sit with, and that is one single fighter plane equals a half a million bushels of wheat. So instead of using this money to feed people, we're using it to kill people. And I'd like you to comment on how the war industry is exacerbating the climate crisis and where we might be able to have some input into that process. Well, I think it was a lot more than a half a million bushels of wheat. It was about houses and infrastructure and schools and all the other things that you could build from one fighter plane. I mean, it's just astonishing where we are wasting our money and where we're not paying attention to human need. And the the, the basis of, I mean, it, earlier on the book, what I say is if we're, uh, the, the pathway to reversing global warming is to address current human needs you know, not future existential threat. Furthermore, it's not future anyway, it's here now. Uh, but to, you know, I mean, like, to, I mean, the idea that, you know, corporations are committing to net zero, that's just a cop-out. It's just a complete, oh, we'll get to it, you know, as if, and meanwhile, they're continuing to do what they do. Um, the war industry is overlooked. Uh, for a lot of reasons, propaganda, corruption, politics, uh, uh, fabricated, you know, conflict, you know, which is created by spoils, you know, minerals in Congo and et cetera, you can go around the world and look at what the causes of conflict are, but the 
causes the conflict are the mindset of trying to concentrate capital and power, you know, in a certain locale, certain country, certain region, certain political leader. And uh, you can't do it without the war industry. And so it's it's a huge, huge industry led by you know who, the United States. Uh, and just like oil companies, fossil fuel companies, coal, gas, and oil, pretty much support every single Republican legislator in the United States, whether Senate or 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 uh, House of Representatives, Congressmen, people. Um, so does the war industry, and even they they. Do Democrats too? If you have a big plant in your district, you're going to be supported by the war industry, and so you have a very unholy uh, uh, circle here of, of of money being expended and money coming back to the districts and you know employment, all that sort of stuff. But I just feel like that the climate movement, if we can call it that, has actually until very recently, but in many ways, sort of not looked at industry except plastic and clothing, you know, and fossil fuels and cars for sure. Um, but there's a lot more industries than that. And they haven't looked at pharma and pharma is an enormously destructive industry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, because it's part of the sick care industry, it's not a healthcare industry. And, you know, the best thing you the best drug in the pharmaceutical industry is something you have to take every day for the rest of your life, instead of actually thinking about what's cause and you know what is cure, real cure, not uh, uh, symptomatic treatment. And so I feel like uh, when we talk about the war industry, you know, we're just talking about a huge area that's you know that we, I I, I doubt anybody here does, but I would say that overall it's overlooked, it's almost sanctified because in the new uh, Republican budget that was passed in the House, you know, this week, um, the, the, you know, people were like horrified that there was even cuts to the military, you know, well, how about food stamps, <laughs> children's <laughs> education, <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, they were like, oh, you can't cut the military, you know, and so um, I just wanted to make sure that, that when we look at climate, we're looking at the whole of the system, and 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 like I said in that last sentence, you know, don't have this carbon tunnel syndrome. That I mean, anything people are doing to reduce carbon emissions, you know, praise be, it's good. Thank you. I don't criticize that at all. What I am aware of is that we're we're very siloed in that we think if we can fix it, uh, that we have solved a problem. And what I'm saying is there is no it there. What's the it? And and I'll go even further to say that there's no such thing as climate in the sense that you can tackle it or combat it or fight it or fix it, which is the the the, the language we're using again and again. And climate is uh, meteorologically speaking just the average weather over 30, 40 years. Um, but when you look at picture of the Earth, you know these beautiful photographs from space, you know, and you look at that little tiny, 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 you know, band. Uh, above the earth, you know, you can't see climate, you can't measure it, you can't photograph it, <laughs> it doesn't exist. And so we have this language around carbon and around climate that is actually an othering language. And that is we're going to fight and tackle whatever it, you know, climate. And that's the mindset that is the cause of where we are today, uh, which is that separation between self and other. Um, and other being the natural world, the living world, um, and not realizing that, you know, life doesn't live on the planet. The planet is life itself, you know, and we are the part of it, in, inextricably connected in ways that are both mysterious and extraordinary and wonderful and complex. And uh, I think we're just chopping up everything into little bo boxes where, you know, you know, a, a bank of all things can say, oh, we have net zero commitments by 2050, while really what they're doing is feeding the fossil fuel industry. Um, so I, I just want to, I think the conversation needs to change and to be more inclusive. And I think when it's more inclusive, uh, there's more possibility. Uh, and right now we're focused so much on probability um, that the possibilities kind of narrow down into climate tech 
uh, as it's known and called, and you know, Elon Musk and EVs and this, and you know, overlooking cobalt and golden miners in the Congo for cobalt for the batteries that are being used today, all that sort of stuff. I'll stop there, but I'm just saying that what but I, we need to open it up. And and so I think with both regeneration and the new book, the book of carbon, uh it's it's just I what I'm trying to do is 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 it's some bigger arms, you know. I mean, it is Mother Earth, Mother Dirt, you know. We're called Mother Earth. I mean, <laughs> it's soil, and 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 um, Mom has big arms, you know. And uh, and we need to start to look at that and embrace that and see ourselves in a context which is far more complex in the best sense of the word and compelling and interesting. Uh, than what I call the carbon tunnel syndrome. All right, thank you for that. Um, before we get off the industry, I, I, there was one other question I have because you connected other industries. We won't get into the healthcare one because that would be a whole hour in and of itself. Uh, but you mentioned the politics industry, which I hadn't heard put quite like that before, but I find it really interesting that it's in that section and the banking industry, because it seems like the war industry, the politics industry and the banking industry are kind of in cahoots in maintaining a war economy. And how do we shift from this war economy where so much money is going toward and funding and loans and supporting fossil fuels, um, which is continuing to be uh, exploited in different areas, how do we convert that kind, those kind of jobs? How do you see those jobs being converted to supporting renewable energy and a sustainable life plan on the planet? I mean, I could say, you know, this is what I think and this is what we ought to do. I, I would actually look at it a little differently, which is that um, <clears throat> there are a lot of really great organizations now that are focusing on this and um, uh, I can make a list of them and send them to people. And I'm in awe of these organizations who are really taking on um, the banking industry for sure. Um, and because it is a fulcrum and also the politics industry um, and we see how dysfunctional it has become and it's an industry because every politician hires companies and they know how to game the system. They're, they're experts. And with AI, as somebody pointed out, it, 20, 2024 may be the last actually free election, true election in the United States because of AI, because we know how to manipulate information, manipulate who sees the information, what information they see, uh, from their response. I mean, regeneration says basically, you know, in we can see the end of the road of the extractive world. I mean, that's where we are now. That extraction, you, like I say, it's a dead end. It doesn't go much further. Half of the life on the planet has been destroyed in the last 200 years, half of the biomass of the planet is missing, AWOL, gone. We did that. But we look at that as extractive, and it certainly is and was. But what we don't realize, probably one of the biggest extractive industries in the world is Google. Because they getting every little bit of scrap of information about you and then reselling it to people who are going to use that to sell you on whether it's ideas or whether it's contributions or whether it's a product or whether it's a service, whether Instagram does the same, Meta is the same. So we have immersed ourselves in sort of extraction on steroids now, not just mining and commercial ag or chemical ag and you know things like that. Now it is surrounds us in every way. And so I'm really appreciative of the organizations that are calling out the banks, calling out companies, now corporations, for the same sort of mealy mouth commitments into the future, you know, calling out Pepsi, who's saying we're going to use regenerative agriculture, whatever that, whatever that means to them, while they're making Tostitos and Doritos, and 94% of everything they put on their truck is ultra-processed junk food. You know, so you're getting this, you know, but people are... Uh, 
you know, especially, I wouldn't say entirely, but Gen Z and millennials, because, you know, uh, they're outraged and they should be. Um, and students coming out of all the universities here and all around the world. And so, but for me to say, you know, this is the solution to, you know, how employment, how to, you know, do conversion, you know, would be, I mean, uh, I don't know. It just, it, it just would, it's like, it's been said before. Okay. But what's happening now in terms of act, activism has not been done before. And that's where I'm really excited. Great, that's good to hear. Uh, I'm gonna move on to one of the other sections that I thought was really interesting and probably affects all of us a lot, is the city and what that would look like. You mentioned that 70% of greenhouse gas emissions come from consumption in cities. And since most people are or will be living in cities in the near future, um, I think this is an interesting place to, to look at. And you mentioned some types of uh, sustainable city living that I'd, I'd like you to talk a little bit about, uh, like the 15 minute city or cities that are already fairly sustainable at this point and what they're doing, urban farming, things like that, bamboo, some of the areas that you point out in that chapter, I think would be very interesting for people to hear about. Well, the thing about cities is that when you look at the politics on a national level, what's being used is cultural issues that divide us. And, and that's, that. It, no one's really seriously talking about policy or children or, you know, how we do with our teachers and, you know, our healthcare workers, <laughs> no one's talking about that. They're talking about these strange cultural issues, you know, transgender, and I mean, it's just like, you, you know, it's like, and, um, but the thing about cities is that once you get to, even with big cities, but you know most cities, what unites us is more important than what divides us. So even though we may disagree about you know, certain things and this and that as people, but our identity as a citizen within a, a smaller geographical area is what actually connects us. And we're profoundly disconnected now as a country, as people, from each other, from nature, you know, and we're disconnecting nature as fast as we can as well. But cities is where people actually have a common interest that they can talk about and share. And um, so that's why there's like Regeneration Melbourne, Regeneration Toronto, Regeneration, there's cities all over using word regeneration. Regeneration Melbourne is, is their goal is to make the Yarra River swimmable. <laughs> like, you know, and it's so interesting because you say, well, it's a great idea. It makes people excited, you know, like, yeah, why not? It, is it not swimmable? No, you don't, shouldn't swim in it <laughs> as it is right now. But what happens is that, that you have to go up the watershed and the watershed goes up 170 miles, but then it goes into all the repairing corridors. So you have a basically a whole watershed you're looking at is like, what's going into the water? You know, and so now you're looking at households, you're looking at villages, towns, you know, sewage systems, you're looking at farming practices, you're looking at pesticide practices, you know, I mean, you're looking at all these things, you know, that for which we have much better solutions than where they're being practiced. At the same time, you're using something that is sort of fun and, and sort of unimpeachable, you know, like, yeah, rivers should be swimmable. <laughs> they shouldn't be, they're not sewage uh, pipelines. And uh, so cities is a place where a, a lot of change could be made, I think, with a lot of buy-in. Second, who likes noise? Uh, so, I mean, cities are noisy. Most of that noise is disruptive uh, to one's thinking, to one's sense of tranquility, to sleep, and so forth. They're polluted. Who wants to be in a polluted city? And uh, they're not safe in many cases or in many areas. Who wants to be not safe? And so what you're talking about when you're greening cities isn't just planting trees, you are. Uh, in terms of making pollinator corridors through the cities, you are bringing back animals and birds uh, uh, into the city and you can actually hear them. You are definitely doing that. But you're also creating localization, you're creating cultures and yes, community gardens and where, where possible you're creating 
you're greening buildings. We know how to green buildings now and just send literally plants right up the side of buildings, you know, and 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 roofs. So there, there, what's happening in the imagination uh, in cities is amazing. The 15-minute city, I think, I think that came out of Hidalgo in Paris. I could be wrong. I forget. No, maybe it came out of Barcelona. But I, whoever gave it gave it the name and that idea is taken off, which is that you should be able to get everything you need as a householder in the city within a 15 minute walk, you know, as opposed to getting in a car and driving where? To the Burbs, to a shopping center, to Home Depot, to Walmart, to God knows where. You know, so that, you know, that changes the city. More people are on the street. The thing that makes streets safe is human beings out there living, talking, having coffee, you know, you know, whatever. And the things that make cities really dangerous is cars and no people. That really, that's the most dangerous city of all. So I'm not saying that the underlying causes of crime don't have to be addressed as well in terms of poverty, et cetera, they do. But at the same time, a city that's actually reimagining itself, that's greening itself, that's changing its infrastructure, restoring its creeks and waterways, that in many cases are buried underneath. There's a beautiful one. I grew up in Berkeley. Uh, we used to, I don't know how I did it, like a mole, but Strawberry Creek is buried in big pipes. And we used to go up these big pipes in the dark. I, I mean, right now it gives me, the, gives me the willies to think about what we did when we were little, but that's Strawberry Creek and it should be unburied a little bit here and there. The whole campus, it goes through the whole campus, University of California. That's true in every city practically in the world because they're built in places that are maybe near rivers, but they're built in places where water came into the river, you know? And so how does it get there? It gets there, you know, in streams and rivulets and so forth. So, um, so unburying those and then using those, you know, sort of wending waterways as the basis for parks, you know, for bicycle paths and so forth. And so I, I, the thing about that is that, that it, you're, re, you're bringing nature to people, people back to nature and you're creating an environment for children where nature is not a stranger, you know, and the sounds of nature are not stranger and identification is not a nature in, and breathing clean air is not, you know, is, 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 is like something, you know, that they can experience, you know? Um, so, uh, yeah, cities is, is just a fascinating area and there's no head of it. You know, there's no, you know, wind energy, you know, big companies, you know, every one of it is done and they, they do it cooperatively. They meet together, cities all over the world, they exchange information, ideas, you know, some cities are very compacted and compressed and they have a different strategy than cities that have uh, more latitude. But um, I think it's an exciting thing because people then, the, the uh, you're addressing climate based in a palpable way that people can experience as improving their lives. And this is what's so important about solutions. People want to live, live in a better way. Everybody does. Right now, in an insecure world, better means getting more money because then you have more, you know, you can buy things, you can live someplace else, you whatever, you know. But if we just think that bettering yourself is money, then we're, you know, we're, we're doomed uh, because the way we make money is through extraction. Yes, I'm gonna to go to um, audience questions shortly, but I, I just wanted to mention that in the different sections of the book, you point out some things, of course, I've never heard of before, but I was fascinated by. And when you talked about deforestation, uh, you mentioned that there were four commodities that are primarily responsible for the deforestation. There are cattle grazing, uh, palm oil, wood, and soy growing of soybeans. And um, there was a very interesting plant that you, I think it came from the ocean. I, I'm not if I'm pronouncing it right, asparagopsis that could be fed to cattle. I, I thought that was a really curious thing. So if you could just mention something about that and about Dr. Brown, Bronner and palm oil. Yeah, Asparagopsis taxiformis is a red algae and uh, it was discovered uh, uh, that has the bromine component that if you feed it to cattle, uh, it reduces the exhalation of methane uh, by up to 90%. It depends. Um, and 
so that is already when I did drawdown, nobody was doing it today. Uh, there's companies all over in different um, formulations of uh, uh, tax uh, asparagus, asparagopsis tax form, excuse me. Um, and who are doing that and they're getting carbon credits for it, you know, I mean, uh, if you feed it your cattle. Um, so yeah, I mean, that that's happening. Um, the, what was the other question? I'm sorry about, about Dr. Bronner's fair trade. Dr. Bronner, yeah, I mean, um, they're great people, you know, that company, I think it's about 200 and some million dollar company today. You know, they don't, even the, the heirs, like, you know, David Bronner and his brother and his mom and his sister, and, you know, they take no profits out of that company. They get paid a reasonable living wage, you know, for whatever position they have, you know, comparable wage. That's it. All other money from Dr. Bronner's goes towards making a better world. And uh, every bit of it, and it's, it's quite outstanding when you think about it. You know, I mean, they don't have a house in Jackson Hole. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, you know, and uh, anyway, they have some of the best uh, uh, plantations in Africa, really in Africa, in terms of palm oil. Palm oil is really great. It's a great oil. There's no question about it. But the way we are harvesting it uh, and getting it is really from Borneo, from these uh, really deep, these peat forests, you know, these ancient peat forests, you know, in the lowlands of Borneo. And uh, it is probably the most destructive form of deforestation because once you deforest uh, 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 these, for these peat forests, uh, then every... Uh, year for 20, 30 years, there's 25 uh, tons of carbon is being emitted by the soil itself, by the drying out of the peat. It's just like unbelievable. And, and, you know, and that palm oil until recently, and maybe it's still happening, is being shipped to uh, Europe as a renewable energy source. <laughs> I mean, not to say it's in candy and potato chips and everything else you read, but but you know this bizarre, bizarre kind of corporate corporatization of, of 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 resources and and then greenwashing, you know, calling it you know renewable energy and and, and just to digress slightly, you know, you have this massive deforestation in Georgia and in Alabama, you know, where where trees are cut and pelletized, and those pellets, I think there's eleven, was it how many eleven? I forget how many billion. There's a Anyway, there's 11 million tons. I think 11 million tons are being exported to Europe for renewable energy. So you're burning trees for renewable energy. And it's just like, so that's the world we're in. And, you know, when other people might have been asleep at the switch, like, what should I do? What should I do? Corporations were all over it trying to do things that made them a lot of money that they could, you know, basically, you know, label as green, as renewable. Uh, and palm oil was one of them. David and Dr. Bronner is just as a wonderful one, wonderful one in Africa, Ghana, because, you know, the workers are paid a living wage. I mean, a really living wage. They have medical care. They set up schools for the children. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just, it's like, why not? You know, everybody could do that. Every company could do that. You know, uh, they're not that big compared to companies on the planet, but they don't, but they're exemplary. Very, very interesting. Yeah, greenwashing is something that we're constantly being bombarded with these kinds of labels and, and, and knowing enough to be able to see through it is important. And I think most people on this call are, are aware of that. I'm going to take questions if anyone, I, I, I know people do want to ask things, but it usually takes a minute or so before people get ready to ask a question. So I'm looking for hands. I see Mary has one. Mary, do you want to unmute to ask your question? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I uh, was just wondering, um, 
uh, whether we should revert back to the terminology of global warming instead of uh, climate change, since it seems really more representative of what's happening. Uh, absolutely. And the reason we should revert, not only is that the accurate description, but second of all, um, there's an idea that we're fighting change, which is, you know, good luck on that one. Um, second, climate is supposed to change. Like, my God, you know, it changes every day and we go outside and we look at it and we wouldn't have strawberries and salmon and rivers and all the beautiful things on earth if the climate wasn't changing every single nanosecond and we're seasons and so forth. So the climate change is not the issue. It's not the problem. We're the problem down here, right where we are. <laughs> and so to, and again, Mary, to have language that assumes that somehow the changing climate is a problem um, implies what? That it shouldn't change? It should go back to where it was 200 years ago to, you know, and, um, and, and again, it ignores, it's kind of like ignores the problem, the cause, and that's us. And that's what we do to each other, what we do to nature, what we've done to nature itself and so forth. And that's why, you know, the book of carbon is really about, it's not about a prescription of what to do, what not to do, but what it is, is a description of just how amazing and stunning the natural world is, you know? And, and, uh, and so to look around us and look, what can we do here and what do we want to do? And, you know, instead of having the, that term climate change, which is actually just scientifically incorrect anyway. Thank you. Um, Louise has a question. You want to unmute Louise? Yeah, there you go. Good. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions, but I'll just ask one now. Um, hi, Paul. Hi, hi Louise. Hi. <laughs> we knew each other back in the 70s slightly, <laughs> or the 60s. Oh, no, I did, I did. When I was growing up, or when I was grown and leaving. I but did. the question is, um, I live in Oakland now in co-housing, not, not under this beautiful oak tree, but um, in a ur very urban setting. Right. And we are, um, I'm in the middle, or the I'm two thirds of the way through a group meeting with my uh, community here, where we're watching a series of films called The Week. I don't know if anyone has heard about them. Uh, yeah. They they seem it's a film, and then a guided discussion. A film for an right. hour, guided discussion, and you have to go and you have to go three times in a week, because the first part is the the down slope, and it talks about the life systems collapsing, pollution, and warming. It doesn't stick with just one of those. And then the second part, which I've heard, is how we got there. Right. Our story for that is that we got there um, because we tell our, we have a story, we have stories of wanting more. Now, I think it goes a lot deeper than that. <laughs> Uh, but it's great to talk about it with the people. The third, the third one is going to be what we can do. And I think these things, I don't know if anyone else has been part of one of these or knows about them, but I think they're great ways to bring people together uh, to make changes in our lifestyles and in our activist in our patterns of activism. And I, I just had, there's another set of things that the work that Reconnects put on that's kind of similar to this that I haven't seen yet, but it seems like with Earth Day this year, um, folks are getting really tired of worrying and not talking about it. And they're really getting together and starting to move. And I wondered if you had noticed that also. Um, and and what you think of some of these projects that people that are uh, hitting the citizenry right now? Yeah, I mean the week um, that's Frederick Lalu and I we talked about it three years ago. Uh, he was talking about creating it and so forth. And, and uh, I haven't I haven't actually seen it, but I know he's an amazing guy, and and his wife did a great job. And 
Um, and uh, he set out to do exactly what you described, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, I, I think my take right now is that in in my work, you know, I'm just like trying to be seeing all these things and sort of cataloging them and you know putting them in different places. Even though we have every every reason to be pessimistic and to be like you know like and shocked by the way by what people are doing saying thinking in many respects, but my sense is that the rate at which change is occurring in I wouldn't call it the radicalization of human beings, but the radical shift in perspective that is occurring right now uh, is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. It's quite extraordinary. And it's underneath the headlines because the headlines are all about lighting up the amygdala. You know, I mean, that gets the click throughs and you go, oh, what? Trump said what? This or that? Oh, what? Okay. Uh, so that's our media, even the Times and the Post do, do the same thing to a certain extent, so does the Guardian. Um, but um, what I'm seeing is, and I, I guess 2022 would be a good example, which is like, who predicted 2022? Like, no one, right? Not even in 2021, much less before that. And who predicted the Yangtze and the Po Rivers would go dry? I mean, um, my wife's Italian, and so I thought, I wonder if it went dry before. You know, there's no record of the Po River going dry in the last 2,000 years in Italian culture. I mean, they, they probably would have said something about it. And uh, and then you have these incredible floods in Germany, you know, and then just wiping out whole villages. And so, so you have this basically whipsawing of the jet stream. And that's caused by warming. It's caused by the relationship between warm air and warm water. It's pretty simple. Now, fluid dynamics is probably so incredibly complex that the computation of it is not simple. But the conceptual understanding of what's causing the, 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 the jet streams to change for, I would say, for decades to come, by the way, this is not like this last year. But what I saw in 2022 uh, was a real shift for a lot of people, including CEOs, by the way, um, where, you know, I'll use climate change because that's their language, but global warming uh, was a concept. And they understood it and they're empathetic or they're sympathetic to it or, you know, we should do something and we are doing something and blah, 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 to becoming experiential, either directly or vicariously. And that's that I've said, and it sounds strange, but our biggest ally is the weather. Because the, the, the weather is going to slap you upside your head. It doesn't care what you think, what you believe, who you vote for. You know, it doesn't care at all. It doesn't even, the climate, doesn't, we, nothing up there cares what we think. <laughs> We're the ones. And so we live in this extraordinary system where the feedbacks are going to get more pronounced. And as I said in the beginning, it's not an apocalypse, it's a feedback, it's a teaching, and it's only apocalypse if we don't go to school. So we are being homeschooled by the earth. That's what happens every single day, it's homeschooling. And uh, this is our home, and we're being schooled. And so I, but I just, you know, every day, you know, I see things like, oh my goodness, look at that, you know? And, and what, beautiful people there are out there and what extraordinary things they're doing all over the world too i don't mean just you know in the sort of the ecological establishment here you know in the united states i mean and there's no real way you can kind of get that sense you know i mean there's no way to step back and look at it and say oh my god those are my sisters and brothers you know and wow and but the, the level of literacy a level of innovation, uh, the level of speaking truth to power, uh, of et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is I would say, you know, because it was like a flat line, you know, it's oh, it's getting better, it's getting better, but it's not more. And I see now it's an inflection point, you know, in terms, of, and that's because things are getting worse. That's why. I mean, there's no other reason. And it's palpable, it's experiential, it's like obvious, and there's a whole new generation. Um, you can't really divide generations as kind of silly, you know, demographers do it. But the fact is that a lot of people, the recent arrivals, uh, you know, are Gen Z, they're the, they're the biggest cohort in human history. They're 33% of the population. 
all right, and born since 2020, and this is 2023. They're a third of the humanity, and not surprisingly, you know, they they're they've said, "What the heck were you thinking?" Yeah, they can see it with new eyes, you know. And the I think one of the dynamics that we see is that people are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, whatever, are saying, "Well, I'm leaving soon." So. <laughs> so I'm I'm gonna protect myself. Oh, I'm gonna make sure you know I have enough money and this and that, and it's great the social security goes up, or whatever. I mean, they want to protect themselves because they know they're gonna die. If they don't know it, they inside they still act that way, you know, which is you know, and so it's two very distinct ways of looking. I, I'm not talking about this audience, but I'm just talking about demographically of looking at where we are right now. Um but again, that's an example of a demographic trend that is overwhelming, you know, and it's going to redo politics in the world, redo politics here. Uh, it's inevitable. It's just like uh, an avalanche, uh, slow motion. And so I would say that we're going to be surprised at not the perfidy and the corruption and the, like, you got to be kidding me sort of pronouncements of ignorant people and companies, but the opposite. We're gonna be surprised by the brilliance and the change that's occurring in this world and embodied in extraordinary people who we don't know yet. I mean, I'm not saying the obvious ones, I mean, the ones we don't know. And um, and it doesn't mean we have, we do, it doesn't mean we can stop. We have to do everything we can and support those people and support that which we know how to do um, but I, 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 anyway, I just want to share that I am not known as an optimistic person, by the way. So I, for me to say this is kind of out of character. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. I'm going to ask the next few people to ask succinct questions because I would like to get them all in, but we may not. Fran's next. Unmute, Fran. Thank you. So, Paul, absolutely a delight to see you and hear you and catch up on your thinking of the moment. So um, I belong to a group here on Bainbridge Island called the Interfaith Climate Circle. And our uh, mission, it, it uh, is composed of about, oh, about 15 different congregations. And our mission is to get religions talking more about climate change or climate or global warming, however you want to term it. And I'm just interested in what your observations are about the role of religion uh, as you look at the changes going on. Yeah, uh, thank you. And thank you for what you're doing. And it's really nice to hear from you. Uh, I, I think the role of religion is to really look at itself and to really see if it's still a, du a dualistic or non-duality. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, because, you know, some are and some aren't. And, but duality or dualism or, you know, is, is the problem. You know, it's the core problem. Uh, and uh, religion has abetted it and expanded it. And I was a, a nice little Roman Catholic altar boy and I missed it, witnessed it firsthand. <laughs> And so, um, so I, I think that it is a teachable moment, you know, the earth is, this is a teachable moment for all of us, you know, we're all students, there is no professors or experts, you know, there's people who know more about some things than others for sure, but, and I feel like what religion can do is, is really, you know, the, I mean, what you're doing is interfaith, you know, but it's really faith. It's common the commonality of religion is, you know, or the or the lack of commonality has to me been the bane of religion. You know, there's somehow one religion is better. Like, come on. And um, so the, any conversation that really brings people together of faith, you know, is really, really, really helpful. Um, because like I said, what we hold in common is much more important than what divides us, you know, because usually what divides us is some thought in our mind you know, some belief we have, you know, it's not reality, you know, and um, so I, I love what you're doing. And, and, and I just think for, to me, uh, and by the way, churches use 
uh, regeneration a lot. I mean, at least, well, I don't know if they use it a lot, but I've been in touch with church groups, you know, who use it as discussion and ways to examine the relationship to the congregation or the temple or, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, synagogue. Uh, it, it relate to what are they doing as a religious institution, first of all, and then what are we doing as the congregants or the members or, you know, uh, whether the Muslim, Jewish, Christian, uh, or um, Catholic, and and other, and um, so uh, I think it's very fertile because I think you have a uh, a depth of integrity and, and commitment and compassion, you know, that is innate, and to me, compassion is extraordinarily important quality to bring to this conversation to what we do. Uh, and uh, so it's already there, you know, in so many different manifested ways. Thank you, Paul. I, when you mentioned being an altar boy, I didn't know you, you had grown up with that. Uh, my first criticism or question of the Catholicism as a child was, why can't girls be altar girls? That was the beginning of the end of it for me. Um, I'm gonna go let me, to- Let me talk to that because I'll tell you one thing, it wasn't safe to be a boy. Oh, I bet. Uh -uh. I bet. <laughs> So the girls girls lucked out on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an interesting perspective. Um, so I'm going to go to John uh, Crowley. No, I could tell you a couple of stories about being Irish older boy <laughs> going about in Dublin. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I digress. <laughs> um, so my name's John Crowley, and I run an organization called Cold Tidal Luma that uses the. Uh, uh, a little closer to the mic, John. Yeah, so use the concept of building social capital to gather people to, to take uh, climate action. And one particular thing that's just come up recently is, um, you know, we've got questions, we've got hundreds of people involved in this. Um, one thing that's just scratching my head at the moment a little bit is the uh, concept of regenerative beef agriculture, us being in, in, in Sonoma County. Uh, you know, the scalability of that even is kind of one of the questions that has come up in the mm -hmm. conversation. And I'm not quite sure how to answer that. I mean, just wondering what your opinion of It's a really important question because you have uh, two sides, you know, who argue about it. And there are the people who say you have to get rid of meat altogether. And that's going to have such a huge impact upon uh, global emissions. And in terms of CAFOs, combined area feeding operations, you know, for, you know, pigs and chickens and obviously cows and so forth. That's unquestionably true. Uh, it's a disaster. Then when it comes to grazing, that is ranches, you know, cattle and ranches, um, then you have people say, well, this is regenerative and those who are just maybe people who are grazing animals on usually public land, by the way, if it's lar large, uh, oftentimes, you know. And so there we have to be a little bit more careful in our conversation. Animals and grasslands co-evolved. So you take animals off grasslands, the, the land degrades and you're getting carbon emissions. So, so that's just science. That's just biology, you know. Uh, and it's not arguable in that sense. The question is which animals on which land in which way? <laughs> so, I mean, obviously if you have grasslands that are wild, you know, and then the, and, and animals aren't predated or, and you know, so forth, and you have some system of actually predation there like a wolf population or others, so, you know, mountain lions and so forth. So you have a natural, you know, um, so the deer don't go crazy and then de demolish the place as well. Um, then you have a really good system. When you have it on cultivated land or that is owned, you know, fenced lands and so forth, um, what regenerative farmers are, are doing or saying or should be, I think is like, is to imitate, you know, basically uh, migration, you know, where, you know, in the Serengeti and the formerly the Buffalo Common, which is, you know, the whole section of the United States, I mean, um, a ruminant, uh, did not eat that grass more than once or twice a year. And they ate it once and they went somewhere south or north and they came back the other way and they ate it again. But they kept moving because they were herds and herds are herds because they're looking for predators. So they grouped together. And so they eat, 
you know, but they don't want to really stand on their pee and poop very long. And so they keep moving. And if you look at movies or films of the Serengeti, you look at the zebra, or you look at different ruminants, you know, and you'll see they just look like they're standing still, but they're not. If you just watch, they're like this, then they're like this, and then they're like this, and then they keep moving like this, like this, you know, and you don't see it in slow motion. And so if you're practicing that kind of thing with, you know, uh, sheep or goats or, you know, cattle in a way that uh, stimulates growth, that is because when you, when, when a grass grows, here's the grass, you know, if you chop it down, and we know that because we pruned for that reason, it actually stimulates the root system and you get more grass and you get more sequestration, more soil health, and you get better water retention and you get health. If you keep eating at it, you know, the plant just goes, oh hell, you know, and, <laughs> and it can't recover. It may recover slightly, but you've gone south. And so it's that, it's that sort of, you know, nexus that, or, or, you know, where it, you know, you're going this way or you're going that way. You've got animal, you've got land, you've got grass, you know. And so the, to me, regenerative beef or whatever meat may be regeneratively produced on land, it doesn't go that way, then it's not regenerative, you know, no matter what you call or what you say. Most of the regenerative farmers that I know and see are very, very, very honest and very caring and so far. I haven't seen it misused on that level. I don't to say maybe it is. I see it extraordinarily misused by Syngenta, Bayer, Monsanto, Cargill, Pepsi, Kellogg's, General Mills. I mean, you just go, come on, you know. Um, and so um, but so that's my feeling in, in terms of, you know, vegans, you know, if, if I think of veg, if you want to be a vegan, be one, you know, but you, you can't, that you can impose that on biological systems, you know, and say, you know, the right thing is for no animals to be on that land, you know, but well, I had friends in New Mexico and, you know, what they were vegan and they were just refused to, to put animals on the land. And I said, well, you don't have to eat the animals. They said, what do you mean? I said, you can put it in any animal as long as you, if you don't want to eat it, don't eat it. So they got retired racehorses. And so it's it's the compassionate taking care of the horses. They love the horses. The horses are being loved and they're restoring the land. So, you know. That's yeah. the best of both worlds, I think. Probably we're only going to do two if we have time. Uh, I'd like to do two more. Uh, Linda, can you make it concise? Yeah, I want to is not concise, not not the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I actually want to go back. I, I I really appreciate your work a lot, and I want to go back to actually what Georgia brought up in the beginning around the banking and the finance and the uh, the military, or the yeah war government banking. How do we get at them? You said that there were some organizations that were doing some good thing, and I I guess I'd like to tag that with, you know, is direct is any direct action useful right now? I mean, it just feels like. It isn't, but I'm curious about your views. A really good question. Uh, I just saw something yesterday. I'll send it to uh, George and she can uh, send it to you, uh, where the bank's feet are being held to to the fire by, by an agency that they have to pay attention to. In other words, as opposed to Rainforest Action Network, you can get Randy and they did amazing things, you know. Uh, um, uh, in terms of the banking industry, but it, I'm not sure it was, they definitely embarrassed them. I'm not sure it made a big difference, you know, in terms of their portfolio and who they're lending money to. Um, but they definitely outed them, um, uh, particularly more on, on forest and deforestation. But let me send the, the thing I came up to yesterday, uh, on banks. And then you have Tom Steyer on Galvanize, uh, his, uh, billion or $2 billion fund, but, announcing yesterday that uh, it's going to be, everything is going to have a carbon footprint, every darn thing, you know, I mean, that's just as an imperative, you know, so you can see, and it's got to be accurate, you know, and, you know, you know, I'll send you that piece as well. Uh, it's just examples. I mean, I saw those in the last, you know, 24 hours, both those pieces. And that's what I was saying uh, earlier to Louise, you know, about, whoa, you know, like, and they're coming from people like Tom and others, but who actually have the resources to go kick butt, you know, as opposed to, you know, Extinction Rebellion. And I know the people very well and, and, and you know, Climate Emergency Fund and so forth. And, but 
they're great, but we also need people who are inside enough into it and knowledgeable enough that can actually make that kind of difference. I'll, I'm happy to get those to you, Linda. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, Jerry. Um, thank you. Uh, how do you uh, integrate the, the idea of economic growth into your analysis? Uh, well, what, it depends what's economic and what's growth. <laughs> well, I, I mean, no, no I, so that's a really good question. I, I well, would... let me let me just respond to that, Georgia. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, you know, the the general way that people talk about it is gross domestic product. Okay, so absolutely. I mean, that, the... Yeah, yeah. That's what I said. Depends on what you say is economic, and so the very. Um, I mean, regeneration is saying basically our growth, you know, is, you know, gained at the expense of the natural world. In other words, we are degenerating, taking, extracting, turning into capital. And then that capital then goes to is spent on something that compounds the problem in the first place. And um, so regeneration is about a 180 pivot is can you make something? Can you grow food? Can you make clothing? Can you build housing in such a way that at the end, when the service or product is being delivered, there's more life on the planet than less? That's the question. And so I'll give you one example of a product that does that figure, uh, Jerry, that kind of figure ground shift, you know, like, well, you know, you build houses out of wood or, you know, and so forth, but uh, where does the wood come from? And how is it harvested? And which forest? And, you know, where did it come from? And all that sort of stuff. Anyway, there's a company called Invent Wood and uh, invented by Ling Bing Hu, who is a Chinese born professor at University of Maryland who got his PhD at UCLA in nanotechnology. And at the University of Maryland, as he said to me once, he said, you know, the thing about being a physicist is you can go really small or really big, <laughs> you know, astrophysics or <laughs> right down to, you know, uh, God particles and muons and, you know, subatomic particles. And what he noticed was that cellulose, you know, uh, in trees uh, grows up of course, trees growing up, and that it actually is very, very similar to nanotubes, carbon nanotubes, it's spiraling, okay, like this, you know. And so he and looked at that and said, wait a minute, that's stronger than carbon, or the steel is carbon steel, you know. And so he has invented this thing and you take wood, it can be bamboo, it can be <clears throat> branches that are cut off, whatever. But anyway, you boil it. So you have hydrochloride and one other chemical. Uh, and then you uh, take out lignin, not all of it, but a lot of the lignin and some of the demicellulose, definitely some of the cellulose, but not all of it. And then you compress it. I wish I had it. I have it upstairs. I run down and get it. If you let, I, I get it and show it to you on camera if you if there's enough time. But um, if you want to see it, I will. But the, the thing is that it is two to three times stronger than steel. It is one sixth the weight. It's one half the cost. And it can replace steel and concrete. So here and it sequesters carbon. <laughs> so this is what I'm talking about in terms of that. Again, we talked about a figure ground shift where I I see a level of imagination, of creativity, of innovation going on in the world. Where you now this will be years before you can buy it, you know, locally or actually being made locally in California will be made, you know, be, can be made all over the world and so forth. But, you know, if, if the World Trade Center, you know, had tower had been built of in Deadwood, it would never burn. It can't burn. This stuff is made of wood. It can't burn. You know, it's not subject to insect, insect infestation, you know. Um, and uh, like I say, it's, and it's just like almost ephemeral. Uh, 
And uh, the first factory is being built right now in North Carolina. And the money came from actually the DOE, the Department of Energy, just gave the company $20 million to build the first factory. So there, there's levels of innovation. I mean, but that's like 12 to 13, 40% of carbon emissions is steel and concrete, right? And, you know, talk about green concrete and this and that. But, you know, the fact is, it's going to be, a, 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 it's never going to be a green. Steel and concrete are never going to be green. And uh, so, um, so economic growth. We want Inventwood to grow because, you know, the way it'll grow, you know, and, and the primary source of growth should be bamboo. It's the strongest of all the woods. Is, it's not a wood, really, but it's a grass. But bamboo would provide the strongest Inventwood, um, more than poplar or any other type of fast-growing tree. Um, and like I said, if you want me to get it, I'll come show it to you right now. Um, but um, so that's... That's, I agree with you about economic growth, but that's why I said, well, what's economic and what's growth, you know? And we do need to provide uh, more to the 5 billion people who wake up every morning and they have current existential threats where they wake up with, you know, whether it's food or safety or the children or education or the heating or home or clothing. I mean, we, if we're not paying attention to them, then we're, we're, we, don't, we deserve our fate. And they are, they are the, the solutions we're talking about that reverse global warming actually create a better life for everybody on earth. And that somehow that is separated. It shouldn't be, you know, it should be no. If there was not a climate scientist alive, we should be doing these things. We had no idea about extreme weather. All these solutions make total sense, you know. They're not palliative. They're not, oh, we got to do this because this is happening and we should fix it. No. These solutions are all like that are in regeneration dry life. They just make a better world. And that's what we're all talking about, you know, and that's what human beings need. Uh, and they need to be, they need to feel that they're cared for and they need to have jobs to give them purpose and dignity, you know, and, and, and that's what restoring life on earth does. That's what regeneration does. And, but in specificity, it's going to have to be something that really makes a difference. And there's so much of that today. Great, I'm gonna take one last question from Julie and then we will wrap up. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Go ahead, Julie. You need to unmute. Buddy, I'm very glad to take the last question, but what we need is in-depth leadership. And I don't know if there's an example of the CEOs of all these companies who have graduated from Harvard, Stanford, Berkeley, et cetera. And if there's any course that is for innovative work that's being done like the wood you just suggested, because we definitely need leadership from these schools. Here's my experience. Uh, and uh, to your point, Julie, uh, <laughs> uh, which is what I'm seeing is CEOs, Okay, mostly men, guess, guess what? <laughs> um, who came up to different systems, right? Corporate systems, all corporate, uh, who were good at what they do, you know, good at what they do. Otherwise they wouldn't be rising up, you know, in the hierarchy of a corporation and uh, where the penny dropped. I got, why they have children i don't know what it was what event what one of them is very devout that i know of uh head of one of the biggest companies in the world um and they got shocked they were shocked when they realized what everybody on this call is acutely aware of okay so i mean that knowledge and awareness is not common. <laughs> and anyway, for whatever reason, whether it's the, their daughter coming back from school or something, but they just, they realized, okay, oh my goodness, you know. And in the ones I know, they were on one, in one, in one hand, on one hand, they were saying, I want to go do something else. I want to go you know, make a difference in the world, you know, this, we need to do something, you know, I mean, just like all of us. And, but 
a lot of them, not a lot, there's not that many I know, but realize, you know, I can make the biggest difference right where I am. And I realize this company doesn't have a great history and is making products that shouldn't be made or if they're made, should be made entirely differently. And where can I make the biggest difference? You know, starting over in an NGO or buying a farm and doing this, or can I make the most difference here? And it's so interesting talking to them because you'd be shocked at the conversations in a good way. You really would be. The sincerity, the honesty, and I don't know if this is going to continue to grow. It certainly isn't Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan and Bank of America and Exxon. And no, 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 no. But you're seeing it and you're seeing institutional investors push back against these, these you know, like, like what happened at Danone where Faber was offed because they didn't quite hit their sales and profit targets. And he committed Danone to be organic dairy everywhere in the world. You know, he's a great guy. So it's not like an easy road, you know, it's not like, you know, but because they're, they exist in a system that is absolutely devoted to making more money for other people. I mean, which is, you know, part of its dysfunction. But, um, but I had a conversation with like a, a CEO <laughs> and we just, it's a really big company and we're eating lunch out of a little takeout container together. <laughs> how much he makes every year <laughs> and we have a takeout container i mean and he turned to me at one point and he said paul what's god i mean it was sincere i mean not that i know i mean not that you know i'm not <laughs> and it was a sincere question and i was like my god you know i mean things are changing you know <laughs> And my answer was to him, I said, it's everything, absolutely everything, you know? Um, and it was a very touching moment, you know? But what I know about this person is that his staff adore him because he listens and asks questions but he's absolutely committed to changing his whole company. That's not his, but the company he's responsible for. So, you know, that's what I'm talking about earlier too, you know, to Luis and so forth. You know, there's things happening, you know, that are, you don't see, and I'm not saying I see them. I just see some um, that would at least allow you to go to bed at night with a smile. Maybe next morning you start all over. <laughs> How screwed up the world is, but. But nevertheless, you know, that's where the world's going. And we look at the paper, we think it's going to, you know, fascism, proto-fascism, and, you know, all the, the, the trends that we see, you know, and so forth. And it is, uh, by the way, and like, oh, just like the 30s. And it could be, it could, that, could be that could be the outcome. Um, but I see something different as well, you know, that's emerging. Great. I want to thank you so much, Paul, for today. This has been a wonderful session. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've learned a lot. We've had ample time to ask you things and to uh, share ideas. So I, I want to thank you so much and remind everybody that this is the book we've been talking about, Regeneration, Ending the Climate Crisis in One Generation. I know our local bookstore readers has it. So you can get it there if you're in Sonoma or near Sonoma. And we do have people on this call from other areas. So thank you everyone for being with us today. And uh, Paul, it's just been great having you. And I hope when your new book comes out, we get you live. Okay, I'm live, but I'm just not there. Right, that's, that's what I meant. <laughs> okay. thank, thank you so much. I'm gonna stop the recording now.